I'm excited to share a few things with you. We are not going to step back into spiritual gifts just yet. We took a little break there. I actually had a missionary plan for tonight, and really disappointed that we were not able to have him here tonight. His name was Jason Holden, and I hope we can get him again sometime. He is already on the mission field, been there for quite a few years. And he was actually the man when Pastor Mike and I went up to Vision. I don't know if Parker was there with us that time, or it might have just been you and I that time. Uh, we had a vehicle breakdown, and this guy had never met us before. He hears that the, our vehicle broke down, and he says, oh, you can just borrow my van. And, he's, and, and we said, oh, well, what do you mean? Like, he's going to take us somewhere? No, he actually took us to his house, gave us his van for the weekend to use, and said, oh, just, just bring it back when you're done. You know, that's just the type of guy that he is, and I was really excited for you to meet him, but it didn't work out. Um, he's in Chile. His family's in Chile. He was back here for a couple weeks, and the country of Chile right now is in lockdown. And so he messaged me Monday morning and said, if I don't fly back today, I'm going to be locked out of this country for probably a month, and my family's down there. So he had to scramble. God, God brought him back. So we'll, we'll get him another time. He is just uh, really, he's the real deal. That's, that's about the best thing I could say. For you there, and this is just a little, just a little um, testimony of the money that you gave to invest in the Our Generation Training Center. That place is run by men, okay? So it's not perfect. The best of men are just men at best. So I'm not proclaiming that they're God or anything like that. I'm just saying they are aggressive for the gospel. Two differences. Two differences. I'll just tell you recent testimonies. Two differences. Number one, typically we see that when uh, mission boards have people that are directors. Those are people that are directors here at home in the U.S., and they'll travel to the mission field. When Vision Baptist Missions has directors, they're living on the mission field, and they are basically like an Apostle Paul, taking care of that continent or whatever, visiting churches, helping those churches. So a different mindset. I'm not knocking anybody. I'm just telling you, they are very intentional and aggressive. Nobody's sitting around twiddling their thumbs playing golf on the golf course, okay? Um, not that there's anything wrong with golf. I'm just saying. The second testimony... So if you like golf, that's fine. I actually like golf. I love to take my shoes off and walk on the golf course. They don't like that, though. But I really enjoy that. Um, the second testimony, so we're, we're moving forward in the future with um, doing some discipleship here in our church. And we wanted, we found a, a, a set of 20 lessons. We thought it was good. It was somewhat simplified in, in this aspect that you wouldn't have to have a college degree to do it. Um, you could take a lot of time. You could take less time. It was very flexible. We liked the program. And so we contacted, I wanted to put it on PowerPoints for our teachers, and I wanted to make handouts so you didn't have to buy the books to do it, you know, or you could buy either one. And uh, so we contacted the company, and they would not let us copy one stitch out of the book. And their, their thought was, well, we, you know, we don't charge very much for these. And I understand that. Uh, we were going to buy the sets, just didn't want to make every person in the church that was involved in it have to buy a set if they didn't want to. And um, so... I'll just tell you right now, I just, that rubs me the wrong way when people that are in ministry make it about money. Um, I get it, labor is worthy of his hire, I get that, but when you are so obstinate that you have to get your money, um, to me, the priorities have reversed. That being said, Vision has a discipleship curriculum, which we've used here, several of us have used here. I contacted the man that wrote it there in Vision, and he says, oh, well here, I got the Word documents, you can have them. He sent me the entire program on Microsoft Word and said, do whatever you want with it. That's the difference in these guys. They are all about promoting the gospel, discipling believers. They're not about making money. They could care less about that other than the fact that you have to have it to live and to build buildings and stuff like that. That's why we gave him the offering. Your money was well invested. That was a whole spiel for that. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 6. I wanted to, because we have been going through a new curriculum in our Sunday school, and I'm not a huge thing on person on curriculum and not promoting curriculum this morning. That's not what I'm saying. I, I want to kind of give you kind of the reasoning behind what we're doing. And as we're moving forward as a church, it all kind of goes towards the same philosophy that we want what you learn here in the building at Eastside Baptist Church, we want that to stick in your life. Okay? And I, there's another um, ministry out in California that has coined this term, sticky church. I like the term. Be it, their whole philosophy there is that the Word of God is not just something you come in here in a, for an hour session or a two-hour, whatever it is, and then you go home and you live your own life. The Word of God is sticking. It's being applied in your life. It's becoming part of your life throughout the week, and that's kind of the whole impetus of what we're doing as we're moving forward at Eastside Baptist Church. 
We've always been a word-centered church, always, right? On Sundays and Wednesdays. And how do you transfer that into the week? Well, that's, that's not an easy thing. And that's not just our church. That's just humanity, because we're all fallen creatures. But we want to make some inroads in that direction. And the curriculum we've been using for going through the Bible in four years, every Sunday morning at 945, if you don't normally go there, which is probably not any of you, but if you don't, maybe if you're listening online, you don't normally go, I would encourage you to do that. And the whole, um, one of the things we like about that, number one, is you're going through the entire Bible in four years, but number two, we're all on the same page relatively week by week. I mean, there's one, in ten weeks, there's one play week, okay? It's normally used for review at the end, but if, like, somebody ended up needing an extra lesson, uh, Brother Larry, we could have had an extra lesson, maybe, um, okay? And that's something you, you teachers can kind of decide on your own, but the whole goal there is, number one, to learn the Bible, number two, to start discussing the Bible together. So it becomes more part of your language, more part of the things that you let out of your mouth. I mean, we all know we talk about things that we love, right, and are familiar to us. So to get the Word of God so that it's familiar and it's something that you love, something you're talking about, not just with church people, this is our comfort zone, but even out. But it starts here. It starts in our families. And tonight we're going to talk about that topic, making it stick in our families. Making it stick in our families. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, at the time, I thought it was the strictest home in the church. Now, I've come to find out that it wasn't, but I thought it was, <laughs> and I felt it was. Uh, my parents are so strict, I can't do anything. But uh, I look back on that, and there was a lot of good things in that. Um, and God bless my parents. I love them dearly, and they are human beings, just like I am. And they made mistakes, just like I do. They messed things up, just like I have done and will do in the future, I'm sure. But there's some things as we look to the Word of God, written by the one who's never messed anything up. Amen? So we can kind of realign towards something that is true, something that doesn't go out, and something, uh, that's the great thing about truth. Truth is classic. Truth never changes. You never find antique truth. It never goes out of date. All right? It's always relevant to everything we do. And so Deuteronomy chapter 6, let's get right into it this, this morning so I can get you out uh, on time. And uh, you're not upset at me by the time you leave. All right, so Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. Pause right there. He just spent five chapters. In part of the five chapters was the Ten Commandments that was given on Mount Sinai, right? And some other things were in there as well. Um, back in the first four books of the Old Testament. Uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, known as the Pentateuch. All right, this is number five, Deuteronomy. So here he is, Moses is giving, not necessarily his final address, but yeah, kind of, kind of here. So verse number two, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's sons, by the way, that's me, my son, and his son, so my grandchildren, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged, lengthened. Verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. That is the promised land that we've all heard so many stories about. Israel was promised this in the future. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Here is where that New Testament passage came from originally. Verse 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have... Oh, sorry, that was number nine. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Let's ask the Lord to help us tonight. Father, we need your help. Please open our spiritual eyes and ears. Tonight, as we find out the direction you were giving Moses to give to the, the people that were put under his charge here, your children, your chosen people in the Old Testament, Lord. And everything that you included in this, this last charge to them, 
Father, would you, as we open this up, would you open our eyes, as we open your truth, would you allow us to see it as you saw it and hear it as you spoke it, Lord? We want to apply it to our lives. We want to be pleasing in your sight. Father, we want what we hear uh, from the word, what we hear in the house of God, we want it to stick in our hearts and lives. We want to take it into our families, whether we be parents here, whether we be singles, whether we be grandparents here, Lord. Each and every one of us can have a part in this. Lord, help us to be aggressive promoting your truth. And Father, show us how to do that tonight. In your name I ask, amen. All right, so we're going to move kind of quick here because I've got several points, so they're not going to be long points tonight, but I want you to see the progression here as Moses is delivering God's word to the children of Israel. And we see, number one, that God gives commands, statutes, and judgments for a reason. For a reason. Now, that might be kind of basic, but I want you to think about that. There is many, many commands, statutes, and judgments here, and we'll, we'll define those in a second, that are throughout this book. And I, I want you to understand, according to God's word, he gave every single one of them for a reason. Now, think about this. Um, we think of it as parents all the time because we wonder why our kids do what they do or don't do what we told them to do. Like, I told you to do that for a reason, for a reason. Um, now, we're human, so maybe sometimes we could give a commandment that wasn't really for a reason or maybe for a bad reason, but God doesn't do that. So there's, we can take that human uh, frailty aspect totally out of this. This comes from God. Everything he gives is for a reason. And he says in verse 1, These are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them. Ye might do them. Well, commandments, commandments basically are laws. Okay, when you're talking about commandments in the scripture, you're talking about laws. These are the statements that are given that are to be obeyed because they're from God. They're not, there's no failure, there's no error in these laws. Okay, these are perfect laws, perfect commandments. Then we have the word statute. Statutes, synonym for that would be decrees, a rule of conduct, boundaries relating to a job or a task, uh, or, or an amount, don't go too much, or don't do too less, or, or limits, time limits, amount limits, number limits. These are decrees, these are statutes, these are kind of the fine tunings of how to live these commandments out. And then we have the judgments. The judgments are the verdicts or the decisions that would kind of keep us inobedient to these commandments. So when to use, when this commandment applies here or when it doesn't apply and, and how to work it out in this specific situation, making a judgment call, making a verdict or a decision. So he says his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, he gave them that you might do them that you might do them. And we see that letter number A right here, letter number A, make them a part of your future life. He's telling them and exhorting them, this is what I want you to do when you step into this land I'm going to give you. I'm, I'm getting ready to bless you. I'm getting ready to give you something you do not deserve. I'm going to do it because I'm your God, and I want you to take this with you. I want you to take these commandments, these statutes, and these judgments, and I want you to make them part of your future life. What does he say? That ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. This is in the future. I want you to take these with you. Make them a part of your life. Obey my commands. Listen to my statutes, how you're going to go about obeying these commands and the, and the rules that kind of go with it, those standards. And make the right decisions. Take my judgments on how to apply these and when to apply these. And make them a part. Make them a part. You can't do anything about disobedience or ignorance on your part that happened in the past. You know, it's God right here in this passage, not saying he never draws attention to what they did when they were wrong, but here he says, look to the future. I want you to draw that line right now. We're going to talk about this in a minute. And everything I'm giving you, I want, or everything I just gave you, these commandments, these statutes, these judgments, take them with you in the future and make them a part of your life. Make them a part of your life. This is key to making, I mean, the most powerful thing you'll ever have in your life next to God himself living in your life is his word. His word. We won't do a study tonight on the power of the word of God, but it is immeasurable, immeasurable. Make them a part of your life. Letter B. Letter B, verse number two. Fearing God is the intended motivator. Let's look at verse number two in chapter six. So that you might do them in the land, whether you go to possess it, 
that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, in other words, your grandson, all the days of thy life. Again, he's talking about future. What is the key to making this a part of your future life? What is the key to obeying these commandments and keeping these statutes and judgments? It's the fear of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord because you and I are sinful creatures and we were frail at best. On our best day, we can't do it without God. We can't do it. And there is something within us that needs to know that we have a Father over us that loves us incessantly, but that is holy and righteous. And he never asks us to be shaking in our boots in front of him necessarily unless we're sinning. He says, oh yeah, well if you're doing wrong, you better be afraid. You better be afraid. That's what the fear of the Lord is. I know uh, many t- it, it has aspects of reverence. It has aspects of respect, absolutely. But it's really viewing God correctly. God is not just love, and he's not just judgment. He is both, because he's holy. And so as much as God loves me, I dare not cross him. That's holy fear of God. Okay? And that's what he says right here. He says that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments. I mean, let's face it, when you and I are falling into temptation, when we're doing things that we know are wrong, we're not thinking about God is watching. We're not thinking about what does God want out of this. We're not thinking about how does God feel about this? How is this affecting my walk with God? Matter of fact, we're normally avoiding those thoughts, right? Because we want what what we're getting ready to fall into. I mean, let's be honest, temptation isn't, we we don't go into temptation unless it's actually tempting unless we actually like it, right? So we're tempted because it is tempting. I don't mean to be basic here. But fear in this context is not terror. It is, I do not want to cross a loving father because there's going to be consequences. Because he loves me. Because he loves me. That is healthy fear. Letter C in verse 2 and 3. Blessings are the intended result of keeping these commands and these statutes and these judgments. Blessings are the intended result. Not an iron hand, if you do not keep these, I'm going to pound you, although that may be true, that's not his intent. That's not his intent. Verse 2 and 3, And that thy days may be prolonged, the end of verse 2. This is why I'm giving you these. This is why you should obey them and keep them in your future, make this a part of your future life here in the promised land, that your days may be prolonged. He says, I want you to enjoy my blessings for a long time. It's not because I want to put you in prison. I want you to enjoy life. Do we not get that backwards sometimes? We think that the restrictions, especially as a young person, I remember this. Now I've matured over the years, thankfully, but as a young person, I really felt like so many things I couldn't do as a Christian. But that's not the way it is. The things that God tells us not to do, the boundaries, the statutes that he puts in there for us not to do are to help us, to prolong our lives, to give us a life that is enjoyable. But we listen to the world. We watch the world. We listen to what they say. We we listen to their propaganda. And we accept it so easily when we're not giving him just as much time, right? When we're not applying ourselves to what's in here, um, it's so easy to listen to all the voices that are coming at us all the time. And if they're not godly voices, and you're not old enough in the Lord maybe to filter through all of those, you can fall to that same temptation. Boy, I'm just not allowed to do anything. I want to go be a part of that church that has liberty in Christ. And they could do all sorts of fun stuff. (laughs) Blessings are the intended result of keeping God's word, keeping his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments. And I was not referring to any certain church, just so you know. Um, In Jeremiah, we see this, even God's judgment. Go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 29. We'll we'll, we'll let you turn to a couple passages here, because some of you really like to do that. I think it's a good exercise. Jeremiah 29. I don't think I have a slide on this, do I, Miss Vinette? No? Okay. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. 29, 10. We see that God's judgment towards disobedience was always for the good of his people. You know, there's a lot of judgment that we see in the Old Testament, right? God points out those times of judgment. Um, I don't know why he does that more in the Old Testament than the New Testament. I think he's still the same righteous judge. But he gives us plenty of these 
examples. Jeremiah 21, or 29, sorry, gives us a little uh, window here. Let's, let's take a look at it. 29.10. Okay, Jeremiah 29.10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. Okay, so hold on. 70 years at Babylon. Who was living in Babylon for 70 years during that time? You remember? Daniel. Okay, so we have the story of Daniel in the middle of this phrase here. Daniel's living. Israel, Jerusalem was besieged by Nebuchadnezzar. They were all brought back. And remember Daniel and his friends and many other people. Matter of fact, the only people they left were the ones, basically the poor people. Just, just a bare minimum to keep up the city and all sorts of other wickedness went on there as well. So that was God's judgment because his people would not obey. His people would not um, put aside the other gods and serve him alone. He really didn't have that many stipulations, honestly, but they wouldn't do it. For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years, so he says when that time of captivity is done, it's going to be 70 years, that be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you. In causing you to return to this place, he says, yeah, you have some consequences for your sin. And it's going to be 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, I'm going to take you back. Because I love you. I want to do good for you. Our holy God has to let us suffer the consequences of our sins at times, even impose those consequences on us. We see that. And he, he finishes it off right here in verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Boy, think of that, 70 years basically being kidnapped in a foreign land. That could seem a little harsh. Don't y'all think? I mean, I think it would. Sometimes we go through trials and tribulations for a couple weeks, and we're like dying. We're talking 70 years here. 70 years, he says, it's for your good. And when you're done there, I'm going to take you back because I only want good for you. I only want good for you. I know the thoughts. I know what I think about you. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. My judgment in your life is to bring about a certain result. It is for your good. We see that as well. Uh, you know the popular passage, Romans 8, 28. Don't turn there tonight. Go ahead and turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. But I'm going to read this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them that love God, and if you study that passage, what are all those things working together for good towards? It's so that you and I will be conformed to the image of His Son. It's to make you more like Jesus Christ. God says that's the good that they're coming around to. All of these situations, whether you see it's negative or positive or whatever it is, God says, I'm going to use them all for your good. And the good is that you're going to be more like Jesus. That's going to be the good, because that's what your Father thinks of you. All right, so we have the truths, we have the statutes and commandments that we're supposed to make a part of our life. We're supposed to take those, not just a Sunday-only thing, not just a Wednesday night-only thing, to really take them into our lives so that we can live long and prosperous and enjoy God's blessings. So how do we transfer these truths on to our families? How do we do that? Well, he's specifically talking to families here. I mean, we'll get to that in a second. But how do we do that? Well, we see this, and let's continue on. Chapter 6, verse 4. A good transfer is built on a resolution. It's built on a resolution. There has to be a decision to do this. Nobody in here, no family in here became godly just by chance. It just kind of happened. As a matter of fact, it goes the opposite direction. Right? When we stop heeding the Word of God, when we stop being aggressive with applying the Word of God, our steps start to slide. That's a, that's a, a scriptural principle. He says there are good transfers built on resolution. Look at verse number four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. How many can tell me in here that you don't have that kind of love without deciding to have that kind of love? Right? I mean, you, some of us have decided to have that kind of love, and we still don't have that kind of love. You're definitely not going to get there without making a resolution. Without making a resolution. This passage right here, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, is known as the, I may mispronounce the accent, but the, the Shema, or the Shema. Okay? The word Shema literally means listen. It is based on the first word in this passage, hear, O Israel. So this word here is not just talking about maybe what you're doing now, as you have, you have already thinking about what you're doing when we're playing volleyball after the service. Okay? Maybe that's, that's you tonight, or you think about what you're doing. That's not talking about that kind of hearing. 
It is talking about taking what is being said, taking the words, the commands, or everything, and applying those, getting those into your life, letting them stick. So we would say that's listening. That's what we would wish our children did all the time when we're talking, right? Listening, listening. A good transfer is built on a resolution. You have to make a decision, number one, to listen, to listen. And you can transfer that truth to your family. The word Shema starts with the word listen. This is truth to be paid attention to and accepted into regular practice in your life. Uh, the Shema has functioned historically as both for Israelites, for Jewish people, even today, has functioned as a Jewish pledge of allegiance, if you would, or a hymn of praise. It is still quoted and recited today with religious fanaticism, quite honestly. And uh, they take it to a whole new level. Those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they repeat it over, they chant it over and over. Um, you'll hear some of them doing that at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. It, it is like, uh, almost like the Catholics around here when they're saying their rosaries over and over. Say these rosaries 13 times and something will happen. You know, they'll put ads in the paper. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those. Um, but that's the same thing. They, um, and Jesus, Jesus addresses this issue in the New Testament. You know, they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. Okay? Um, or their prayers that are just repeating the same things over and over again. That's why we don't pray prayers from a book. You don't need that. You just go right to God and talk to Him. You don't have to read somebody else's prayer. That's not your prayer. That's somebody else's. You just go talk to God. When, when Jesus died, He tore the veil. He allowed you to go into the Holy of Holies only because of the blood of Christ. And now you can approach His throne with boldness. Get help in times of need. Amen? That was the Shema, though. Okay? And these two verses encapsulated that. It was a, re a resolution that was to be made by every Jewish person and every Jewish family. It, it was a, specifically, I think we can apply it if we think back on the land that they were living in. And even though we talk about other gods and worshiping other gods, we don't really have statues. And, I mean, there's not people in our country that we know of um, sacrificing babies to Molech, or putting them through the fire, or doing stuff like that, and if they do, it's illegal, okay? They lived in a land that did. Many, many false deities, many, many false pagan practices, and God puts this before him, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. What is he saying there? He's saying, I am the only God. There is no other God. And he says, because of this, in verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your you don't need to divide your loyalties up you don't need to like this one and this one and this one like those in india do jesus christ is one of their gods okay jesus christ does this for them this god does this for them this god does this for them god says i'm the only god that's it i'm the only one you love me with all your soul heart mind and strength and this is now giving us an outline for tonight. Amen? But more than that, more than that, it was giving um, the Israelites something to make a resolution. We can stand on this right here. Our God is the only God, and we're going to love Him with everything that is in us. Everything that is in us. And as we're talking about families, which is the context here, we'll, you know, teaching them to, to you, your sons, your sons' sons, we need to, number one, decide who God is, in our lives. Who, who is God to you? And then you need to check that with the Bible and make sure it's true. Who is God to you? If you believe in the one true God, if you believe that God is everything that He should be in your life, then you need to decide that you're going to love Him with everything that is in you. Everything. What does that mean? Well, that means I'm going to remove anything that stops me from loving Him with everything that is in me. And that's where the tough decisions come, right? I mean, let's just be honest. That's, that's a difficult one. Decide who God is. Decide you're going to love Him with everything that is in you. Sometimes I think maybe we're tempted to think that our families will just turn, turn out right if we just pay the bills and we make sure they don't get on drugs and get pregnant. Keep them out of jail. And that's the best we can do. If that was your past mentality, I'm encouraging you tonight to accept God's mentality. And that's not it. God wants you to pursue, start implementing His commands, statutes, and judgments in the life of you and your family. I don't want to get too far ahead of my outline here, but it starts with this, making this resolution. I'm going to do this in my family. Let us not forget that our family is from the Lord. 
Our children are a heritage of the Lord, Psalm 127 says. So number two, a good transfer has a starting point. So we've got to start somewhere. Remember, God is talking future. He, you can't do anything about yesterday or last week or last month or last year or last 20 years. You can't do anything about that. But you can do something about tonight. You can do something about tomorrow. You have to start somewhere. But when we talk about a starting point, I'm not even necessarily referring to a start in time. Let's look here, Deuteronomy 6.6. Um, 6. What does he say? Verse number 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Whose heart? Our heart. It has to start with us. How many in here know that you knew when your parents did not believe what they were telling you to do? It was usually one of those things where the teacher had some rules, and your parents were respectful enough of the teacher to support their rules, but they didn't believe them. They didn't, they didn't think that, so just do what the teacher says. But you knew uh, that your parents didn't agree with it. And so what were you doing? You were like, okay, so that means to me I'm going to obey the teacher when I'm in front of the teacher. When I'm not in front of the teacher, I don't have to because my parents don't agree with them anyways, right? So we look for all those outs as teenagers, and I think you can probably remember that. It is no different here. If you are imposing what, if you want to call it this, what Eastside Baptist Church teaches, which it ought to be only what's in the Scriptures. If you find that it's not, you need to let me know as a pastor. It's my job to make sure that's what we're doing. But I don't know of that going on. If we're teaching what the Scripture says, then our children, our grandchildren, those who are under our authority in our homes, whether it be adopted or relatives, whatever it is, they ought to be able to believe that we believe what we're saying. It's not because Pastor Sean says we got to do this this week, or uh, Brother Larry's your Sunday school teacher. He says you got to believe this, so we're going to do this. That only goes so far. That only goes so far. They need to know that it's real to you. You know, I, I think you can get away with a whole lot of humanity as long as you're real. As long as you're real. There's nothing that kicks a kid in the teeth like hypocrisy. Do what I tell you to do, although they know you're not doing that. There's nothing that kicks them in the teeth like that. I'm going to blame you for something that I don't even do myself. I'm going to tell you that you've got to do all of these certain things and keep these certain standards, whatever it is, and act this certain way, but they know when, if you were in front of the teacher, you wouldn't be doing it either. And it is a challenge. I get that. It's a challenge for me. It's no different than me. I mean, try living in a youth pastor's home or now a pastor's home. You know, it's a challenge of a whole different nature. But it has to start with me. You think, it, listen to this. So here I am preaching to you, and i got to go home during the week and be with my kids, and they have to know that what I'm preaching, I really believe that. And they're going to know by the way I live. They're going to know that. And I can either kick them in the teeth spiritually, and when they're 18, they'll fly the coop and do what they want, or even if they do fly the coop and do what they want, they're going to have in the back of my mind, Daddy really believed that, and I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be doing this. That will never leave them. That will never leave them. As a matter of fact, God promises you train them that way, they'll eventually come back. And we can bank on that promise. I know we're all going through stuff in our mind right now. Well, what about this and what about this? God says, <laughs> God says, and his word can be trusted. Okay? You just got to forget the timeline of all that. You got to forget that it's got to look like a certain thing. And just trust God that if we will implement his commands, his statutes, his judgments, if we will train them in the way they should go, they will return to it. They will return to that. God promises. Okay? I'm standing on that. A good transfer has a starting point. Number three, a good transfer also has to have a destination. So it starts with me, but it has to go somewhere. Okay? In verse number seven, it says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. He is specifically teaching in the context of the family here. But you need to teach it to your children. Now, your children in this room are all different ages. They're not all young. They're not all old. We have a whole range. But they never stop being your child, right? You take on a different role when they leave the house. You become more of an advisor. And can I encourage you, don't stop advising. Do not stop advising. Do not assume that because they've left your house means you have no more input in their life. 
Do not become the person that never confronts sin, never confronts and, and speaks the truth and love to your kids that aren't in your house. Um, you, what, what's going to happen? I have the same temptation. My, my daughter lives in Tennessee, and I am feeling that whole thing out. And that is a, that is a strange bird to me, to find that balance. And uh, I don't always land on the right side. But I can tell you this right here in this verse, if you're going to make this decision, this resolution, and it's going to start with you, it's going to be real with you, then point it in a direction and give it to somebody. Have enough faith in God that if you give his commands, his statutes, his judgments to your children, even if they don't like it at the time, that it's going to bring some fruit. It's going to bring some fruit. He says here an interesting word that I actually misinterpreted previously, um, or I'll say this, I didn't give it the full depth of its instruction. Interesting word in the Hebrew, he says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. I always thought that meant just hard work. And that's definitely part of the meaning, but the word diligently actually is the Hebrew word shanan, and it means to sharpen or to wet, okay, W-H-E-T, as you would like a knife or a sword. It also means it could be translated sharp, wet, pricked, teach, okay? It has the idea in every one of those words, though, the idea of sharpening. In sharpening a blade, I'm not a, I'm not a metal smith, okay, but I know a little bit about it. Sharpening a blade depends on a lot of things. Effort, amount of effort you put into the sharpening. Patience, patience. Those of you who sharpen blades know to sharpen a good blade. I mean, even with machines nowadays, it still takes some patience, and you can, you can put a little bit of money in and save on that patience a little bit, but you're going to pay for it. Uh, consistency also determines, uh, has a, to do with the quality of the metal. The quality, you know, our children are different qualities, right? We have a lot to do with that quality. We have a lot to do with that quality. We have a lot to do with creating uh, our kids to be um, quality children, or not, or not. A good transfer needs a destination. I remember this uh, when we're talking about this word sharpening, or diligently. Um, when I was in carpentry for quite a few years, I would always in my pouch, now my boss taught me to keep, uh, have his biggest pouch on the job and just put everything in the pouch. And I thought it was a good idea, so I did it. Now I'm older, it's like, man, this thing is heavy. <laughs> but back then it seemed like a really good idea. And I had everything in there. So I had a couple wood chisels. And I didn't know anything about sharpening wood chisels. And I saw an old school carpenter get out his whetstone and he was like, And I knew the amount of nails that I hit with my wood chisel, I was going to be sharpening every weekend, all weekend. It's like, this is not going to work. So what did I do? I took the lazy way out. I saw another carpenter get out his belt sander. <laughs> and he's sparks flying everywhere. I'm like, now that's the way I'm doing it right there. The only problem is your chisel only lasts <laughs> just a couple months, you know, way down. That's not what they're talking about here. That's the easy way out. And that makes a totally different sharpening. It does. Totally different edge. Has a totally different quality to the, the chisel. The chisel's angle becomes off. It's no longer straight on one side. And that nice 15 degree cut in there so you can chisel a, a nice mortise in a door uh, frame or something like that. Now you got it on both sides. But it's sharp. It's, it's, it's still going to cut. But it's not going to cut the way it was intended to. Let me just let me encourage you, don't take the shortcuts when it comes to your children and your grandchildren. And I know that's easy to do because we get impatient and we get frustrated and we don't see an end in sight, but you just need to look back at the promises of God, not rely on what you're seeing because you can't see it. Number two, don't rely on your own intuition in this. Go back to the word of God. It always works, but it takes patience and time. A good transfer, lastly, requires saturation. He says there in verse number 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. You want to talk about the scriptures when, he says right here, when you're sitting, when you're traveling, when you're laying down, when you get up. The scriptures ought to be something that are on your lips frequently. He says in verse number 8, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, having them constantly in and around everything you're doing and frequently on your mind. I'm going to do this quickly because we're about out of time here, but uh, go ahead and show that screen if you would, Miss Annette. So the Jews, again, the traditional Jews took this and still do to this day to a religious extremist point. 
because they are earning their way to heaven. So they're going to take this passage and they're going to do exactly what it said. So they've come up with these binders that actually bind the Word of God to their hand. And you'll see it, I think it's on the back. Uh, let's see, if you see on the upper left, or the, the Word of God is actually on their muscle right here, on their arm. And then it's frontless between their eyes. They'll put the Word of God on that. That's a Jewish soldier there in modern day. Puts the Word of God right there on his head. On his head. These are religious rituals. That's what they have become. But the symbol, and it's very obvious through the Scriptures, if we study this concept, God wasn't saying for them to do this. Okay, even Jesus even uh, chastised the Pharisees for their phylacteries, which is very similar to what he has on his head right there. They became a status symbol. That's not what God is saying. I mean, men have done this all through history, taken a principle God has done and made it into a religious rite. All of a sudden, this is how I gain favor with God, by attaching Scripture to my head or putting it on my muscle somehow. Right, Because that's so much easier than just accepting the truth that God says and obeying God. How do we get that so mixed up? That we can put all of these restrictions on ourselves when God has already laid out the best way for us to do it, and it's actually easier. But it's harder on the inside. Because we're selfish and we're stubborn and we want our own way, including me. That's what they're doing here. Who knows, maybe nobody's witnessed to these, this gentleman right here. And so he's doing it just like the Scripture said, just like the Muslims do, just like the Mormons do, just like all of those people who believe that they can work their way to heaven. They found a principle somewhere, and they're going to do it. So think of this, though, as we're talking in the Scriptures, that they're to, to, um, well, what does he say there in verse 9? Let's let's go to verse 9. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Well, if we're going to take that literally, we'd think all of us need to go home and write Scripture all over the walls, the doors, outside in the yard, everything, right? Because that's what he says. No, he's, he's teaching us a principle here. Now, to be fair, think of when this was written. Fifth book of the Old Testament, most of the scriptures were not even available to people yet, and if they were, it wasn't in a book or on a tablet or anything like that. Much of it was word of mouth. So he says, I want you to talk about it all the time. I want you to write it everywhere you can. I do not want you to forget my word. That is the principle. Don't allow your, the God's Word to be forgotten in your family. Do not allow it to be God's Word on Sunday. We're going to do our thing the rest of the week. Carry it throughout the week. Let it stick in your family. And we're going to bring this to a close because I have a quick illustration. Uh, so ancient days, saturation meant all of those things we just read. But there's some universal principles that we can take back. Uh, number one, intentionally talk about the Bible in your family. Make it Intentional. How many in here know that if you're not intentional with that, it's not going to happen? Every once in a while, your child will have a curious question, every once in a while, and you'll get to answer it. Just like you're waiting for that one person to walk up to you on the street and say, how do I be saved? That may happen once in your life, or maybe twice, if you're really like you wear some Christian t-shirts. That somehow they know that you're a Christian, okay, or, or you're a preacher, or whatever, okay? But uh, we're not quite to those yet. Okay, so universal saturation principles. Intentionally talk about the Bible. Number two, apply the Scripture to all areas of your family life. Don't let it be, this is what Brother Sean said, or this is what Pastor Sean said, but we kind of do something different. Well, number one, just make sure that that's what it is. It, it was what I said, not what God said. Okay? You can disobey what I said all day long, but if it's what God said, oh, be careful. Oh, be careful that you're applying it to your everyday life. Don't just apply it to what we do at church. Apply it to what you watch. Apply it to how you live, how you treat each other. Apply it to your everyday life. I, that's what I try to do all the time, and I mess it up all the time, but I'm getting better at it. Number three, have the Bible posted in view of your family. Now, that is the principle here. Have the Bible in front of your eyes as often as you possibly can. We have all sorts of different ways to do that now. He's not saying you've got to write it all over your walls, although if you want to, he's not telling you not to. There's totally different times that we live in now. But how many in here know that you can have it all over your devices, your Bibles and everything, you can close them up Sunday night and not look at them again until the following Sunday. So it is no different for us. You just have to be creative and get it out there. Get the Word of God around you so it's in front of your eyes. So it is being, uh, I don't even want to say, I don't want to say the word subliminal, but it, you're just around it all the time. You're seeing it. You want the Word of God to become part of your life. In conclusion, there we go. 
Make a family resolution to love God and His words. That was point number one. Live that resolution in yourself first. Grandparents, parents, consider it your duty to do these things. And I don't mean that. That is not akin to obligation. It is your duty. It is your responsibility. Do not let yourself off of that hook. And saturate your family with Bible truth. Saturate your family with Bible truth. There are so many different ways to do that. You're going to have to decide how to do it with your family. I know I'm a few minutes long here. I just want to show you one more thing. We have these books. We teach this 945 every Sunday morning in whatever class you're in. It is being taught unless you're two and three-year-old and Miss Stephanie, and they're probably not going to be discussing what's being taught in the lesson at that point, okay, or in the nursery. I don't think they're... Are they discussing Bible things, Miss Carla, in the nursery, those little kids? No. Okay, so if, if you're in a discussable age group, we're going through the same thing. Okay, so I put last week's. So I'm just going to give you just a little idea because I realize not everybody understands how to do this, and I'm going to tell you right now that it can look totally different in every single family in every situation because every single family is totally different, okay? So this is not, Pastor Sean said we have to do it this way. That's not what I'm saying. But this is a tool, and I'm not trying to pressure you into getting one, but not many people have gotten this. So I hope that you have your own method. I'm going to show you this method, and I think it's a good one. Some of you adults, most of the older ones, we don't offer this to the teens just yet, $5. You're actually working ahead on your lessons using these books here. A great job. I appreciate you doing that. I think that's probably um, something the older folks are more investing in. But we have this for families. It's a family devotional based on the 10 weeks that you are going through at 9.45 every Sunday morning. Last week was God Guides Us, okay? Uh, you guys can see that better than the, the screen there. So here's what I do. I've got my easy chair, all right? It's the only piece of furniture we didn't get rid of before we moved. All right, now somebody gave us a couch or whatever, but I had to get rid of some of the, the relaxing furniture. But I kept one, one. All right, so I get in my easy chair, all right? I'm sitting there. Normally, Jason comes over here next to me. Everybody in the family that is home at that time, which we try to do it when everybody's home, um, we sit them down, and we open this book. It's, it's really difficult. I just start reading. So I learned to, I learned to read many years ago. So I, I labor through this. God's Word guides us. So Now, the cool thing is I know that the, my, my kids' teachers have gone over some semblance of this during the week. So they're already somewhat familiar, even if the teacher only got like a little bit of the lesson. It's already been discussed. Do you understand? So God's word guides us. Just, just bear with me. I'm, I'm running about five minutes long here. As believers striving to live in a way that pleases God, it is of utmost importance that we know how to study God's word correctly, or as the Apostle Paul puts it in 2 Timothy 2.15, that we're rightly dividing the word of truth. We learn to ask questions of the test, text like who, what, when, where, and why. We also learned exactly how God's word can guide and change us. After all, the ultimate goal of Bible study is not to gain head knowledge, but to become conformed to the image of Christ as God's Holy Spirit takes His Word and uses it to transform our lives. And there's another paragraph, but for sake of time. So I finished reading that paragraph, and I come to the read and discuss section. That's the next page there. Okay, so here I'm looking at this. And here's what I want to do. I want my kids and my family to be vocal. I do not want them to listen to me for 20 minutes and then go off and do their own thing. Because it's too easy to daydream or nightdream or whatever time it is. 2 Timothy 3.16. So I have everybody, that's that first reference. They have their Bibles. Bring your Bibles in here. We're all going to open our Bibles or tablets or whatever. Um, I think all of my kids use a Bible. I think one. I think Lily likes using her tablet. So 2 Timothy 3.16. I have somebody volunteer to read that. They read the Scripture. Okay, 2 Timothy 3.16, I believe, is all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be truly furnished or may be perfect truly furnished unto all good works I think it's close so we read that scripture first question what are the different ways that God's word can guide us what does each of them mean and I wait you say well what if they don't know well let's look at the verse and let's figure it out together Anything to get them involved in answering that question for themselves so it's not Daddy said this. It is God said this, and Daddy helped me to understand it. You say, well, what if you come on a question that you don't know the answer to? Well, number one, I would say don't be intimidated by that. Yeah, that's going to happen probably every lesson. Number two, let that motivate you to find the answer. 
You don't be satisfied. Well, I don't know that one. Oh, well, I'll go on. Then, right, then we're no better than our kids who just listen to Daddy and be okay with what Daddy believes. Daddy can believe that. I'll figure out what I believe later on. No, take this seriously. Th these are, uh, this is just one tool. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but this is just one tool to take the Word of God that's already being taught on Sunday and to help it to stick into the lives of your kids or your grandkids, and it's already here. I mean, these are five bucks every 10 weeks, so that's, that's what, 50 cents a week. Okay, I think all of us can afford that. If not, just see me, and I'll be happy to help you with that. All right, so then you've got questions. Here's what I loved about this. Um, we got, I think we got, um, we almost got to number seven or eight, okay? We did this one time, one time last week. You say, you don't have family devotions every night? I don't. I don't have it every night. Uh, I don't think family devotions is a program. You may have them every night, and that's great. That's awesome if that's the way your family chooses to do it. The point is, get the Word of God around your family. Have whatever method you're using. This is a tool you can do that with. Um, I, I do it one time a week. I, quite honestly, with my schedule, I feel like I'm doing good getting it one time a week. But I make that time happen. We're going to find a time when we can do this once a week. And we sit there, and my kids start thinking, they start discussing, and I become the commentator on what they are saying. And it is in, really enjoyable. It is really enjoyable to hear your kids, your grandkids, your wife talking about the scriptures and not just parroting your answers, but discussing it. Figuring it out for itself, because most of it, honestly, is not that hard. It's really not. If we'll just sit there and think about it and let God speak to us. Amen. I hope that had been a blessing to you. I didn't want to keep you too long tonight, but I wanted you to see what this is. So today was lesson number six. There's ten lessons, ten weeks. So you have four weeks before this book is done. I don't expect you to buy this book, although there's a couple left if you in the office. If um, I will know, ma'am, they're in my they're in my office. So see me if you want one of these. Um, you can't have mine though. Okay. And uh, see me if you want them though. You can have you can have it for free. And the next order is five dollars. So I'd say in two weeks. We need to order another one if you want to do that. I tell you, you will not regret it. But whatever you're doing, you may not write it over your walls. You may not wear it on your head or on your muscle. But you need to do something with it. You need to do something with the Word of God. Do not let it lay for the entire week. We are, going, we are moving into the, uh, into the future here at our church. We're, we're going to look for even more ways and methods to get the Word of God into our lives during the week. We're going to try and help you with that. But if you don't resolve to do it yourself, there's only so much I can do for you. Now, I can't be your daddy, and you don't want me to be, I'm sure. Uh, that's not even what I'm saying, okay? Uh, God, has facilit God has given you the ability to do that. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, use the time God has given you. You only have your kids for a short while. 18 years flies like that. You know it. And uh, your influence has diminished once you become the advisor. So take advantage. Take advantage. All right, let's all stand. If you would, we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. I hope there's been a blessing to you. I know that was 10 minutes long. I apologize for that. But uh, I really wanted you to see the value in these books, even if you choose not to do it. I'm not checking. I don't get a list of who does it and who doesn't, okay? We just want to bless you. And the word of God will be a blessing to your family. Let's pray. Lord, we love you.